Hey, it's the holiday season and we're approaching the end of 2022. And I wanted to celebrate by bringing the top 10 episodes back to the front for everybody to see or listen to again. So today we're going to start our top 10 countdown with number 10. It's an episode that we released in January of 2022, so earlier this year, with Bruce Frazier and Megan Davenport. Originally episode number 225, so hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe. Uh, super excited for today's show. It's another one of our Ask the Expert episodes. We have two amazing people on the line with us. Um, we've got uh, two Texans today, uh, Bruce Frazier and Megan Davenport. And uh, you know, as, as we typically do, our you know, most experienced investor is up to bat first. So Bruce, welcome to the show. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. It's uh, it's been a while. Um, so always good to be on the line with with Bruce Frazier. So I'm very very excited to to talk to you today. But, I appreciate that. I just lost my volume for some reason. But um, yeah, Brian. Actually, last time I saw you, you didn't have a beard. <laughs> so I know. that's new. That's new for me. But uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I like, I like to say, you know, tugging, tugging on my beard. I, I retired this long ago, you know? So um, yeah, the <laughs> last, last time we saw each other was I think two weeks before my, my actual retirement date. So I was still clean shaven, but uh, yeah, you're still counting down the days. Yep. Still counting down. But uh, you know, now, now I'm, I'm actually about ready to get my first retirement check. So that's, uh, that's nice. Uh, I, I feel oh, like well. a lot, a lot older than this, you know, half gray beard looks, but uh um, anyway, Bruce, do us, do us a favor and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yep. Bruce Fraser with Elkhorn Capital Partners. Um, I am uh, exclusively focused on multifamily. It's what I do day to day. Um, I got here a little bit differently than a lot of people. You know, a lot of mm -hmm. people's path, they start with a single family rental or, or a couple fix and flips and it just starts to grow and they decide, hey, I'm going to go do something bigger. I'll go do an um, apartment complex and maybe start mm -hmm. with a 30 unit or, you know, kind of build on up. Um, it, it sounds a little crazy, but I used to run a, a options-based hedge fund, which sounds mm -hmm. awfully scary, but uh, it was managed to be a, a steady return strategy. And so mm -hmm. actually the risk profile is not that different than what we do now, but um, managed money through the financial crisis very successfully. And uh, mm -hmm. we didn't um, draw down during that, the, the scary part. And um, after it, um, you know, we had a lot of investors that were asking me, hey, what else are you doing with your money? Aren't, shouldn't mm -hmm. we be buying real estate? Because inflation is going to be coming. The Fed's going to start printing money. We want hard assets. Yeah. That was around 2008. And I, I just felt based on my research that it was still too early. But um, back up, I guess I had been heavily investing in real estate with one business partner up until late 07 when we sold everything. And uh, mm -hmm. we had been doing um, SFRs and um, small multis as well. But based on the research, we we decided to sell. And then um, I formed Elkhorn in 2010 mm -hmm. uh, and have been doing this uh, since. All right. Now, now you're, you're located in Dallas. Where's your portfolio located? It's not in Dallas. Um, <laughs> we here, uh, we focus on the South and Midwest. Uh, we have mm -hmm. a really heavy concentration right now in Oklahoma and um you know, we, we started off investing in our, our backyard, like a lot of people, uh, mm -hmm. Dallas, Fort Worth, it's a really good market, but, um, you know, people were offering us basically four low five, uh, high four cap on, mm -hmm. um, on C-class property that was not that great. And it was already a hundred percent full and we'd already boosted rents, you know, 15%. So, mm -hmm. um, I felt like I was obligated to take that money and, and allocate it elsewhere. We, uh, we started investing some in some secondary markets in Texas for a bit, but really found some of them to be too small for us. And so mm -hmm. we um, um, decided to, to move onward. And really what we're looking for, we like markets, really we're targeting markets that are around a million MSA or bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we want to be able to go into a market and buy a lot of doors. Uh, it's when we first started off, we thought, yeah. gosh, you know, diversification is what makes sense being an old stock market guy, you know, mm -hmm. um, we'll have one asset here, one asset there and found out very quickly that that was really not the model that we wanted to pursue. We felt that it was much more effective to have a uh, heavy concentration in a handful of markets, just because at that point, you know, every broker in town, you know, yeah. um, you know, the, the property management really well, you know, all the contractors around, you know, the vendors, 
and they know you. And so when you need somebody, you need them fast, they show up because, uh, you know, you, mm -hmm. you have a lot of doors with them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, I'm going to ask you to put your, your, your hedge fund cap on right now. And, and you mentioned things, you know, about the, the crash in 2008 and, you know, rising interest rates, you know, what's, you know, it, what, what's your, your view of the market right now? I mean, and, and just put things in perspective, it's mid November right now, week before Thanksgiving or a couple of days before Thanksgiving for anybody listening to this. Um, and I, I think the recent data came out, you know, we're at 6% year over year inflation. So what, what's your, what's your uh, read of the tea leaves, so to speak? <laughs> My crystal ball. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we, I will say, you know, we, I just spent a lot of time writing a piece on inflation. I think I shared it with you, Brian, already, yeah. but um, uh, we do, we have put a lot of thought into this because I'll, I'll say you know, I've, I've been on panels and, and, and things like that at different industry conferences over the years. And, and um, Brian, as you know, I don't, I don't go on many podcasts. You're, you're yeah. one of the first couple, but um, um, I would say, I think it was three years ago, I was on a panel and um, every single person at the conference was saying how late stage real estate was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's always been my experience in investing that when everybody believes something to be true, that it's just simply not. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, our firm has made millions of dollars over the last few years. And, and it's not that we're momentum chasers at all. We just believe that um, inflation is not transitory. You know, we inf we believe that it is really, um, you know, it is here by design. I mean, the simple realism is that inflation is is a plan necessity of the government. It's not uh, an an accident. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the government is in so much debt and continues to increase it that that they have to inflate their way out of it. It's really the only course of action. There are only really four potential things they could do. They can uh, raise taxes, cut spending. <laughs> Uh, file mm -hmm. bankruptcy or default or, or inflate. And the easiest path, yeah. of course, is to inflate. So we yeah. believe that that's what they're going to do. Um, you know, even if the rate of increase starts to, to decline and mm -hmm. they start to celebrate that, we still realize that that's stacking on top of what we're already seeing now. So it's just continued inflation. So with that, what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. um, the number one performing asset uh, historically during inflationary periods has been commercial real estate. And um, so that's where we focus all of our time. We really have honestly, a, a voracious appetite to buy as many um, hard assets as we can, as quickly mm -hmm. as we can, as long as they meet our underwriting. Right, right, right. So so you're basically, in a nutshell, you think that the, the inflation is here to stay. The higher than, than the last decade's worth of inflation is, is here to stay. And I, I agree with you. I mean, you look at the options the federal government has, the first three you mentioned are not going to be very popular with anybody. So um, it leaves them with, you know, letting inflation run and help pay off some of the, the debt. So, um, yeah, and in fact, the, the fed has even said, they're going to let it run hot for a while. They've, they've said yeah. that themselves. And so they're not even contemplating raising rates you know, in a traditional inflationary environment, um, increasing rates come along with the inflation, but yeah. based on what we've already talked about, I don't think they're going to talk about raising rates a lot, but we think the worst case scenario would be them raising a 25 or 50 basis points in the next yeah. few years. Now, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if the Fed raises rates, that also affects their own debt service, correct? That's exactly why they won't do it, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I think the, you know, lo looking from, from what you've said, you know, the Fed's in a position where if they raise rates to curb inflation, they have to increase their own debt service and potentially slow down the economy and that affects their tax revenue. So they're going to let things run hot a little bit so that the inflation can take care of some of that debt and they can still enjoy the low interest rates themselves. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, they're already borrowing just to pay interest on their debt. And so if they mm -hmm. raise rates, they have to borrow more just to pay interest on their debt. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's not a good situation. Um, so let's, let's talk shift gears, tiny, a tiny bit right here. And let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the deals you guys have done. Um, you know, pick, pick your first or your favorite or your most recent and uh, give us an idea of the type of things that Elkhorn does. Sure. Um, favorite. Gosh, you know, you never know which one's a favorite till you're done with it. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, we, uh, I guess I could profile too quickly, but we, um, you know, we, we focus on distress situation assets. Mm -hmm. And so that's a niche that we've morphed into over the years. Um, you know, I would see, say that the vast majority of investors out there are, are chasing what they call value add uh, investments. Mm -hmm. And so they're going and buying a nice stabilized deal um, that's running really well and they try to make it uh, run even more perfectly and mm -hmm. boost rents accordingly. And, and that 
works for a lot of people. A lot of people have made a lot of money during that. Mm -hmm. But to me, that seems almost high risk to expect, you know, basically take something that's running super well and then expect perfection from there. And so I think that's that seems to be more hopeful to me. Um, or expecting cap rate compression where you're mm -hmm. um, you're buying something that's not really cash flowing. You're just hoping that someone pays you a, a higher valuation later. That seems, um, yeah, that just doesn't meet my risk yeah. appetite. And so a lot of people look at what we do and say, oh gosh, that's risky. But to me, it's not because we buy stuff that's broken. And if we mm -hmm. fix anything at all, it's worth more. <laughs> you yeah. know? We don't need perfection. We just need it to be less terrible. And so, um, you know, in line with that, two quick examples. One, one's a little bit faster, but uh, when brokers call us, and generally brokers do call us with the deals, we're not out hunting for them uh, because of what we do. They they know what we're looking for, and there are fewer buyers at the table, so they they ring us. And we had this broker call us. And he said, you know, before you look at it, because I always look at Google Maps, mm -hmm. he said it looks like a minimum security prison. And so I pulled it up, <laughs> and <laughs> sure enough, it did. It had you know all these rectangle or barracks maybe uh, mm -hmm. more in line with you know your background, but uh, yeah. all these perfectly rectangular buildings on about 11 acres. I think there was one tree on the whole place. And, um, and it had an eight foot chain link fence around it that didn't even meet <laughs> everywhere. It was non-contiguous. And so I didn't yeah. know if that was keep people out or in, it wasn't real clear. Um, but we took over the, pro when we were in, well, when we were doing due diligence on the property, um, we found out that the cousin of the owner was managing it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's always, uh, ripe with uh, inefficiencies. And so mm -hmm. we, uh, we started uh, our inspections because we always inspect every single unit. And uh, the guys called me up and said, hey, Bruce, you've got to come look at this. And so they wouldn't tell me what it was. And I thought it was just going to be some nasty, terrible unit. But uh, we walk in and they had taken, there was this building where the office was, it had six units upstairs and six units downstairs. Mm -hmm. And they had taken and cut, cut a doorway through every single unit upstairs and made it one big redneck mansion for themselves. Yep. And they were using all the downstairs units for other personal reasons. And so they had 12 units of 144 or whatever, wow. it was like eight, eight 8% of the occupancy just to them, themselves. And the owner didn't even know. And so um, anyway, long story short, we bought this thing. It was, you know, this was a number of years ago, but for four mm -hmm. and a half million, I think we put 300 grand in it and it appraised a year later for seven and a half million. And it was a property going in. I thought, eh, it'll be fine. But you know, it's mm -hmm. an absolute home run. You just never know. And, um, I would say the heaviest lift, but hopefully the one that we're going to be, you know, one of the kind of proudest of, maybe not proudest, but very proud of is, is one that we bought during COVID. Uh, we we mm -hmm. did, I think, about four deals during COVID, but this was just a terrible asset owned by an owner that you know, just kept taking every dollar out of it. And you see this happen a lot in some secondary yeah. markets where owners just bleed the property dry. And so the property manager has no money to, to do anything with. And, you know, tenant will move out and the appliances are broken and they don't have any money to replace appliances. So that unit goes offline and that, that yeah. spirals until the property is almost, you know, half occupied or worse. And, and, you know, they have to do something drastic. And so they've been trying to sell this asset for a long time for 45, 50,000 a door. And we were just, were wholly uninterested. Every broker that came across, it would bring it to us. Like, no, I've seen it, don't want it. Mm -hmm. um, COVID hit and, you know, we ended up buying it for, I think it was 27 or 28 a door. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was just terrible property. I think there were more homeless people living in it than there were uh, paying tenants, wow. but um, had to go in, you know, just take control of the property. We ripped all the mansards off and put new siding or a, a vertical hardy on it, mm -hmm. new windows. And the place looks just markedly different. You know, our plan to exit on that thing was, you know, we, we figured, hey, if we just get out where they were expecting to get out at 45, 50 a door, be a home run for our partners, it looks like we're probably going to get out mid 60s a door. And so um, it, it's just, yeah, it's going to be great. But um, it's still work in process. It's, it was one of those that every time we'd go on the property, you would just sigh you're like, oh, my gosh, there's so much work to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, but we feel like we're over the hump at this point. Yeah. You know, I think when you put your your kind of your, your deal box philosophy together with your concentration philosophy, you, you get a lot of, a lot of things working together for you, you know? And so your, your properties are all concentrated in a couple of markets. So when you're doing one of these heavier value ads, like you said, you already have the people in place. You have a lot of contractors that you've worked with, you have experience with. And so for some, for someone like Elkhorn and like you, that's that, that is much less risk because you've done it over and over and over again. So, yeah. And in fact, on this deal I'm talking about, I mean, the bank, frankly, they wouldn't have loaned to us during COVID mm -hmm. with that kind of asset had they not been able to go walk, you know, half a dozen or, or more of our assets that are in the immediate market, see what they 
what they look like and how they run, you know, and so they mm-hmm. could get comfort with us doing something so, um, so rough. Yeah. Now, speaking of the bank, since, since you, since you brought it up, I, I would imagine that with what you're doing, that brings you into the, the bridge loan or the, the bank loans for most of these. And you, you probably don't have a single agency loan on the book, I imagine. We do. Actually, we mm-hmm. do, but not going in usually. Yep. Um, it's rare that going in, we do uh, agency. Mm-hmm. We've got a great relationship with Freddie and, and some other uh, long-term lenders, but most of our deals on the forefront, we do go in with Bridge um, mm-hmm. and uh, we, we work with a handful of different groups in that regard. And then um, because of the value creation that we tend to achieve in that first year or two, when we refinance, because um, we'll go in with pretty high leverage, mm-hmm. generally, you know, wh- whatever they'll give us. And, um, but, you know, with, within the context of knowing that we're going to create this values, so much value in that first year or two, that it's actually going to ultimately refine to a low LTV deal. And mm-hmm. so we, we generally, I think our whole portfolio, if you look at it in aggregate is sub 60% LTV mm-hmm. uh, on the, nice. on everything. Yeah. So we, we like to be you know, bulletproof, but, um, but going in is, that's not how we do it. Okay. All right. Now, one question that, uh, I like to ask because it helps me peer into people's souls a little bit. Uh, but uh, here it comes. Ready? Um, put my my X ray goggles on. But uh, what is what is your big burning why? What drives you? Yeah, what drives me? Um, yeah. I've heard you ask that on your podcast sometimes when I was out walking during COVID and listening listening to you talk. And, and you know, mine's a little bit different than yours. I know yours mm-hmm. was getting back home to family and not mm-hmm. missing out on those special moments. For me, I think generally I, I was usually at those, you know, because the fund that I ran, it was my company and mm-hmm. I could be where I wanted to be generally, but it, you know, you weren't always mentally there. Um, yeah, I was never the guy on the phone in the back or out in the hall. I, I always um, hated that. You know, I never would mm-hmm. do that, but you know, I would be watching a, a ballet recital and might be thinking about why silver's reacting the way it is to what Powell just said, or, you know, it's just, you know, so um, for me, part of it is that, and part of it is just frankly living longer, you know, and and having, um, I call it the corner bakery standard. I would, I drink a lot of caffeine. I used to drink Mm -hmm. Diet Cokes. I quit that, but I drink iced tea. And sometimes I'd go to corner bakery in the morning uh, to, to, they have really good tea. And so um, I would go there and fill up and be on my second or third. I'd be reading, you know, research on my phone or trading, I'd look over and there would be a group of, of uh, friends, you know, guys sitting at a table and just, just talking and hanging out or having a Bible study. And um, I mean, that was the last thing in the world I could consider just sitting and burning a morning, you know, with friends. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, for me, it it, partly that, and then, you know, one last quick analogy. I I remember when I first started grad school, this guy joined our, um, our grad school group and he had been working in New York and making, and this was a long time ago, right? I'm old. Mm-hmm. He was making half a million dollars back then a year. And that was a, that's a ton of money now, but it was a yeah. shit ton of money back then. It's a lot and of money. so, um, and I asked him, I said, how in the world could you leave that? And he said, I would have been dead in a year. And um, if I kept doing it. And so, you know, the stress yeah. of running a fund, I mean, it, it was immense. And, you know, our, we had a, a we delivered really low, volatility returns to our investors, but doing that was not low stress for us. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I love what we're doing now and I love being able to influence the outcome much more effectively than you can in the stock market. And it also gives me the ability uh, to create a legacy for the kids. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I like the analogy. I mean, I know a lot of people who are involved in, in, you know, stock market funds and things like that. And um, it, it's something you always have to be on your game on. It's, it's a very short term. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of things you do in there are short term and real estate is you, you can take your time on a lot of things. So, um, good enough. Well, and all the really bad stuff you can generally insure against. <laughs> <laughs> true, 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 yeah. true. Uh, yeah. Title, title insurance, fire insurance, flood insurance, you know, and I, I guess where you're at, you probably have some tornado insurance and, you know, all kinds of crazy, yeah. crazy stuff. Wind and but, hail. Uh, yeah. Wind and hail. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, the last question for you, and then we'll bring, uh, bring Megan on. Well, last question for me, I know Megan's got a lot of questions for you, but, uh, um, what's next for you? Oh, um, you know, more of the same. We, mm-hmm. we love what we do. We're having a great deal of success. And, um, you know, our goal was to be, like I said, concentrated and maybe four or five markets to the same size we are right now. Mm-hmm. We're over, you know, we're somewhere between two and 3,000 doors in Oklahoma City. We have under contract right now over 500 doors in, in, um, in Tulsa. And um, you know, our plan had been to go in and um, add in another market. And we were mm-hmm. just about to do it 
about two weeks before COVID hit. And so we backed away from that because it required a, a flight. But um, we, we quantitatively target different markets that we in, are interested in. So I guess what's next for us is just continue to build this out as long mm-hmm. as we continue to buy the hard assets at, at good uh, with good underwriting, you know, because we want to help as many investors as we can um, protect their own capital and, you know, from inflation that we see coming. Yeah, absolutely. So, so ba- basically more of the same, just looking to, to rinse and repeat the, all the great stuff you guys have done already. More cowbell. Yeah. More cowbell. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to switch here and, and bring Megan on. So Megan, welcome. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate yeah. you having me on today. Yeah, no problem. And and coincidentally, um, I didn't plan this, but uh, we we interviewed your your husband on this podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago. His episode aired today, so now he um, texted me. He was so excited. <laughs> yeah, and so so for anybody listening, you know, be, make sure that you uh, you go back and, and listen to you know Brett with uh, my my good friend Aaron actually. So. Um, and speaking of Aaron, Aaron's got uh, properties in Oklahoma City too. So, you know, eventually we'll have to, you know, eventually we'll, we'll all get together in Oklahoma City or something. But, uh, um, you know, that that said, uh, Megan, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. So my background is a little diverse. I've done mm-hmm. several things. Uh, I started out through, I was putting together my background for you, and I realized how long mm-hmm. ago I started my professional career, and I was just a little bit taken back by that, but. I started out in 1991 as a hairdresser Mm -hmm. and I did that for several years. Uh, It allowed me to have flexibility with my schedule, kind of be with my kids and those kind of things. So that was great. Uh, From that, I moved into working for a local ministry, started out as their admin, Mm -hmm. ran childcare center, uh, taught music for a little while. And then from there, I went to trying my hand, my first hand at being an entrepreneur truly. And I opened up a secondhand clothing boutique mm-hmm. um, that lasted very short. It was a little bit ahead of its time as far as the economy went. So it didn't do really well, but I learned a lot during that time. Mm-hmm. And from there, I felt I needed a little more security. So I went to work for a major construction company of civil contractor. Mm-hmm. And I did that, started out answering phones for them, and shortly after got thrown into running their compliance program for their Department of Transportation, which mm-hmm. was a whole new world for me. And so I got to learn that by the seat of my pants and learned all about federal motor carrier safety regulations and yeah. what it meant to have a program and put together a program and worked hand in hand with the HR department and the IT department and the attorneys. And so that was really an interesting time for me. And that program is still up and running. I keep in Mm -hmm. touch with my old boss. So that's kind of neat. That was a long time ago, but it's growing strong. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And from there, I went into construction, project management, the project management side of things in commercial and residential Uh, construction. Something, again, I had never done, but I learned how to do, and I got really good at it and had great profit margins and learned about all of the contracting, the the entire world of construction contracting. I got Mm -hmm. involved in insurance restoration work, mostly with residential, Um, did a little bit of construction defect work on some multifamily properties. Mm -hmm. So again, steep learning curve, but it was great. And I put a lot of new tools in my own tool belt and And very applicable to a multifamily investor, by the way, (laughs) very applicable. It's one of those things that I never really thought that I would touch again. Mm -hmm. I almost prayed that I would never touch it again. And sure enough, here I am. And my focus is asset management. So I'm Mm -hmm. absolutely pulling those skills back out. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Now, a little diverse. yeah, before we get to your big burning why, I, just, I saw you uh, a post that you put on LinkedIn a couple of days ago. It looks like you guys just closed on, on a property, right? We did. Yes, nice. we closed on a property in Houston. Yeah, in All Southwest right. Houston. All right. Well, congratulations for that. Um, looks like 144 or so units. Uh, so um, amazing. Good job. And you know, I hope that uh, that goes well for you. Now, um, I remember, I remember when we closed on our first property, um, I, I had a, I, I paid for a mentorship program. 
but my mentor, you know, called me up, said, congratulations. And he says, now the real fun's going to start, you know, and, and we thought we had to work really, really hard to get things across the closing line. But uh, um, yeah, so I'll say the same thing to you. Congratulations. And now the real fun's just beginning. So yes, sure. thank you. And you're right, boy, we thought there was so much that went into just the LOI and competing yeah. with other companies and writing up the PSA and and now we're closed and getting to the closing and everybody says it's, you know, the law of that first deal and, you know, being able to get it to the finish line was really exciting, had a lot of ups and downs, emotions, and, and we're just truly excited. We're in the takeover process and the asset is just beautiful. It's, it's running, it's cash flowing already. So mm -hmm. we're just awesome. excited to start doing some turns. Well, great, great. And I'm, I'm sure you'll do extremely well in managing that asset because of that, that uh, experience base that you have and bring to the table. So um, anyway, so talking about all that, um, you, you've got a, a, a wide background and a vast array of different experiences. Um, what, what is your why for getting into multifamily? It's a couple things. So, mm -hmm. you know, after speaking with my husband, he's still in his W-2 job. Yeah. And I have always had the flexibility of being the entrepreneur in the family and doing and trying new things. And so when this opportunity came to us to join the realm of multifamily, you know, my husband is actually the one that came in and really floored me by saying we were going to do multifamily. And I'm like, wow, okay, here's this guy who, you know, he's military background, he's mm -hmm. W-2, he's the financial, you know, mainstay for our family, never in his life has wanted to do anything entrepreneurial because it scares him to death. Yeah. And here he is with this, you know, multifamily, completely entrepreneurial spirited adventure. And I'm like, wow, if, if you're into this, I'm definitely into this, you yeah. know? And so one of our whys is to get him retired from his W-2. Nice. So that we can just fully dedicate our time to this. Uh, we have four kids. I have my first grandbaby. And so the other why for us is really legacy, creating a legacy mm -hmm. for our kiddos and hopefully pulling them into the fold. And, yeah. you know, my That's oldest daughter is, is getting married to one of our partners. So mm -hmm. we're already kind of going in that direction. Awesome. Awesome. That's, that's great to hear. Now, um, if, if Brett's anything like me, um, I, I would say he probably had a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit in him the whole time. Um, I, I, in, in my particular case, I always wanted to be the entrepreneur. But when I looked at my wife and my kids and started looking at the risk versus reward, sometimes sometimes I looked a little bit too much at the risk and, and started thinking about, you know, stable paycheck versus, you know, unlimited, you know, um, the unlimited potential that entrepreneurship can bring to you. And it wasn't that I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I, I think Brett's probably a lot of the same way. I, I've talked with him several times and I think personality wise, we're, we're very close to each other, but uh, um, anyway, thanks for sharing that. Um, so here we go um, with my favorite part of the show, Megan, we got Bruce on the line. What do you want to ask him? Wow. So Bruce, you have been in this industry for a good decade, at least. And so I'm hoping to glean from you some next steps for us at Gibby's. Um, so when you're looking at your properties from an asset management point of view, I'm going to kind of ask you that first. What are the, like the top five metrics um, that you look for on your properties and why do you feel those are important? Sorry, I had muted myself. It was noisy here. Uh, all that matters is NOI. You know, at the end of the day, um, you can focus on revenue. You'll get revenue, but you know, maybe at uh, an over over heavy expense. Focus on expense at the expense of revenue. And so, I think you know, at the bottom, uh, at the end of the day, the best thing to focus on is NOI, and it, it's best to create a comp plan structure that incents your people on site to focus on NOI. Now. They're not going to have uh, the experience that you will have had and, and how that impacts everything. Uh, you know, they wouldn't have gone to business school or anything like that, but you can start to teach them the basics. And I think that they start to think more like a business owner because it, we may own a, you know, five, 10, $20 million asset. And there's someone that's making 30 or $40,000 a year. That's basically running the ship. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't teach them how to make good decisions day to day um, it, it's, it's not going to be very successful. You know, I'll give you an example. We had a uh, asset that um, 
I guess they had carved off a bedroom out of a, a two or three bedroom unit and made mm-hmm. it an extra office for a regional manager. This is before we, before we bought this asset. And um, either way, it needed to have a bathroom put in it, whether it stayed as a standalone or whether it was put back into the other unit. And so they were pushing, hey, we need to take this wall out, put it back in another unit. I said, well, let's talk about that. I said, how much rent will we get incrementally if we add that better? And it's like, you know, hundred bucks extra a month. And mm-hmm. they said, and what will we get if we rent it as an efficiency? Well, probably 600 bucks a month. What do you think we should do? Like, well, yeah. we should probably just do it how it is. I'm like, exactly, let's go do that. You know, Bingo. and so it's just taking the time to explain to them why that's a good decision. And they start thinking that way or, hey, you know, if there's not money in the operating account, ask me for it. Uh, don't just forego that assuming $1,200 of plumbing fees, you know, because we had a situation mm-hmm. where there's literally a plumbing bill, you know, it's going to cost 1200 bucks to take three units back online. So they just didn't ever ask for the money. And they were offline for six or nine months. And, you know, the, the amount of revenue that cost us was, was terrible. So I think um, teaching them how to, how to think, you know, how you want them to think uh, about running the business and then just staying on top of them, you know, trust, but verify, as they say, you have to be able to monitor these things. Um, you know, occupancy is obviously a key driver, but it's not the most important driver because if they're not paying, if they're bringing in tenants and they're not paying, then that's not very helpful either. It's probably counterproductive. Um, so it, it's a combination of things uh, for sure, but, you know, work orders, um, you know, that's one thing that a lot of newer uh, investors don't really focus on, but, um, you know, if you're a tenant in, a, in an apartment, because um, we've all been there at some point, um, what's important to you? Hey, if you call and something's broken or leaking, that they come fix it right away. And if you do that, you make your tenants happy and they're willing to renew. And if you don't do that, they move out. And so mm-hmm. it's really simple. And so uh, work orders are something we focus on, making sure that, especially in this labor environment, that those maintenance guys um, are getting that done, um, motivated to get it done and um, making sure that uh, the leasing agents are, are motivated to, to screen the people effectively. And you have to be careful on how you're, how you're comping. And you really do, because if you're comping just for applications or you're comping just for getting pe- someone to move in, then that's what you're gonna get. And they're not gonna pay the next month. They won't, won't have been screened effectively. So it has to be a combination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I appreciate that. I really like the educational piece of that and, and helping them to understand you know, our business model and, and why we're looking to do what we're doing. I, I like that perspective. Thank you for that. Um, my other question would be with regard to scaling our business. So for you, if you were to look back at where you started from, what would be the one thing that you would do differently? Hmm. Well, Honestly, the one thing I would do differently that I regret the most doesn't involve scaling. So let me let me carve those apart. Um, yeah. the, the thing that I regret most is, um, you know, and I see this happen with new people all the time, is you have to make sure you're aligning your debt to the, your expected business plan on your property. So if you're planning to go in there, yeah. uh, you know, bump rents and do that and sell in year three or something like that, don't get a 10-year loan with yield maintenance on it. And, um, you know, some of the assets that we bought early on, we planned to hold long term. And so we just went for the lowest interest rate, which meant that there would be a yield maintenance prepayment penalty. And that has cost us a lot of money and it can actually trap you in a property. And um, so I would discourage you from doing that. You know, you're going to save a few basis points on interest rate, but just don't do it. Uh, We only do uh, step downs or fixed uh, prepayment penalties so that we know exactly what we would owe if we would decide to sell. Cause you just don't, don't know when plans are gonna change or frankly, when some, some dumb money is gonna come knocking the door and off you something crazy and you just wanna mm-hmm. take it, you know? And so, um, you know, I think our lowest round trip, you know, return average annual to date is like 16%. That was the, that was the worst. And that you know, would have been probably a 22 or 23 if we had not had a prepayment penalty. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's really good advice. So I'm really thankful and, because, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, and then on the scaling side, um, you know, I'm extremely conservative, extremely conservative, bootstrap myself, even in the fund that hate to spend money because it's, you know, even the, you know, to build an organization because it's coming out of your pocket, supposedly, you know, when you're, um, when you're trying to start off on your own and everything, but I would encourage you, and in retrospect, the best decisions I made were adding good team members and bringing them on and probably bringing them on earlier than I did would be the wise decision because it frees up so much of your time that um, you can accomplish more together than you could you know, separately hoarding your cash. 
Yeah, that's I like really, that one. That's great. And that actually leads into my next question. So it's like you're reading my mind. That's <laughs> well, I've been through this. That's why. Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for me, um, besides asset management, I'm really, well, and it kind of goes hand in hand with asset management, honestly, is just the systems and processes that you create when you're looking to scale. So what are some of the key performance indicators that we should be tracking uh, and what would be your recommendation as to how we should track them? And then in line with that, what would be those markers that would say it's time to expand and actually bring in a new employee for like those really repeatable processes and things that would be easy to hand off to someone else? Yeah. And so answering that last part first is, um, you know, what is what is your highest and best use of your time? And, um, you know, for for me, it's going and finding these you know, bonged up properties that I can go fix and make good return on. It's not probably for me to be focusing on the assets that we already own every day and trying to figure out how to make an extra half percent or percent out of it a year. And because we have a lot of repeat investors. And so if I go find a new deal that we can double their money on in a couple of years, they're going to prefer I do that than to figure out how to make an extra percent on the deals that we own. Now, that being said, you, you, you can't ignore the properties that you have and let them not run effectively. So, so how do you bridge that gap? And, and it's tough until you get enough scale. But what we did, we recently hired an asset, a full-time asset manager. And um, she is in the markets that we're in. And she goes to every, not every property every day, but she's at some of our properties every day, just hands-on making sure that things are happening that are supposed to be happening. Because, um, you know, we, we have a standing call with our property management company, our regional director that we go through, all, all of our properties every week. But, you know, if, if we give some instructions, say, hey, let's let's make this happen this week. And then, you know, it doesn't start to happen. And next, we don't find it out till next week. Well, that's that's lost revenue. You know, that, that can be a lot of money. And so you have to have people that are following up and making sure that all that's happening. Um, they don't necessarily have to be there on site. Some of it could be done remotely, even if it's an intern or um, a student that's wanting to learn from you, you know, yeah. that you could hire part-time and, and help chase some of that stuff to free up hours. This time is so valuable. And, and you know, your, your best uh, use of time most likely is finding some additional opportunities so you can scale your business and, um, and then build out some more infrastructure behind it. Hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, But, but some, some key metrics, how long does it take them to get a make ready done? Um, mm -hmm. You know, because if, if you have a vacant unit, um, just because the people moved out doesn't mean it's ready to be moved into. And so uh, how long does it take? You know, what does it need? Does it need flooring? Does it need paint? Does it need just cleaning? Um, let's do that. And let's make sure that happens rapidly. You don't want to let them um, take weeks or, you know, months for yeah. goodness sake to get a unit turned, which they will do if you let them. And mm -hmm. so you have to stay on top of them. And if you have to outsource it, outsource it, um, you know, because of that money, I mean, because if, if I go spend... $300 to a painting company to come in and paint the whole thing, the whole unit brand new. But if I waited on my property manager to do it themselves and it took them a month, month and a half, well, I've say I've made so much more money by paying the $200 to have it done. Right. Because uh, I got that extra, um, that extra rental that I can't get back because that time is gone. Right. Right. That's something that we're looking at right now is trying to balance, you know, what is the best use of our full-time maintenance person right now? Mm -hmm. Is it really taking care of the maintenance tickets? Is it balancing that with some unit turns, you know, and trying to figure that out? Do we need to bring on another part-time person to help out with those things? So we're, we're taking a look at all of that. Yeah. E even, I mean, we're dealing with this too in scale. And so I think our resolution to that has been, I think the maintenance guys on site, their priority should be the work orders. Mm -hmm. And because it is a different skill set generally, and then we are looking to outsource the scaled capacity on the uh, make credits. Right. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense, honestly, just so that they can focus. And, and I know that maintenance tickets that go un, untaken care of are not a good yeah. thing. Yeah, no, it's dissatisfying for sure. Yes, for sure. And, and it can it can impact your property negatively. If there's a leak and it continues mm -hmm. to leak, well, then it affects the unit downstairs or it creates mold or you know something like that. So you have to be on top of it for those reasons as well. Also yeah. liability. Maybe there's a, a stair that's broken or a carpet that's pulled up. You don't want to get sued because someone slipped. Oh, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. So I think those are those are my major questions because those are some of the things that yeah. we're just looking at right now is, you know, as we take over, you know, what's the most effective use of my time? Um, are, 
our group at Gibby's is really pretty balanced. So mm -hmm. my husband takes care of the business acquisitions and looking for new properties. As a matter of fact, he's texting me right now saying, I've got three <laughs> the property. properties. <laughs> yeah. looking at them and I'm like, wait, 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 because you're really, you know, I keep telling him I want to just get this, you know, get this asset stabilized and then, then maybe let's go for another one at the end of December. Um, <laughs> But, you know, yeah, we've got you know, an investor relations side and everything. So, you know, just trying to figure out what that's going to look like for us, you know, going forward <laughs> into 2022 and trying to make our plans. And I mean, one last bit of advice, I would say, um, you know, go as big as you can, as early as you can. You know, don't get don't you know lean out ahead of your skis, but um, it, it doesn't take any more time to do a 200 unit than it does to do a 50 unit. Yeah. Uh, both on the getting the transaction finished as well as overseeing. And, and that actually might be easier to run a 200 than a 50 because you can't have the same team on a 50 that you can on a 200. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, get to that level as quickly as you're comfortable, but um, you don't feel like it has to be, you know, step by step by step. You know, maybe you partner with somebody. If you are, you know, one thing I'll say about the industry, if you do partner with somebody, it, be explicit about partnering with somebody. Don't say, hey, look what I just closed. And you really brought, you know, a hundred thousand dollars to the deal or something. Yes. Uh, and every, you know, everybody's yeah. claiming the same doors. I think um, um, that's disingenuous. And the last thing you want to do when you're dealing with investors is be disingenuous. Yeah. And so, it, cause they'll poke at it and they'll realize, wait, you're not really the one in charge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then they don't have any trust in you, you know, never do anything that would violate trust with your partners or vendors or anybody else. Yeah. yeah I think that's really wise advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much to both of you. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, um, the asset management part's not uh, not in my wheelhouse inside our business. So I, I was taking notes over here. I'm like, oh, that's a good point. Good. But uh, very, very much appreciate you guys' time today. Um, yeah, Megan, wonderful questions. You know, and Bruce, as always, you know, every time I talk with you, I, I learn something new. And this has uh, not been an exception to that. So um, wow. very much appreciate you guys' time today. Yes, thank good you. to meet you, Megan, and good to see you, Brian. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure to subscribe. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to thetribeoftitans.info and we'll see you there.